The letter to the church of Sardis is so bleak. And I think it's one of uh, the most neglected letters of the seven churches. It's one that people just sort of kind of skip over because if they really took a deep dive into it and, um, you know, connected the dots, I think they would would really be um, alarmed by what they read there. So today we're going to be taking a look at the letter to the Church of Sardis. And I know there's a lot of people out there who look at the letter to the church of Laodicea and they read about how this is a church that's lukewarm, it's neither hot nor cold, and because they're lukewarm that Christ is going to spew them out of his mouth. And people who um, uh, adhere to that historical church, um, you know, that the seven churches represent seven different church ages or however you want to look at that that the church of Laodicea is the end time church that is full of compromise and corruption and so on. The most devastating letter uh, that is written to the end time church during that time of very great difficulty after the first rapture, the warning in this letter to the church of Sardis is far more serious than the warning that we get in the letter to the church of Laodicea. So let's go ahead and read the letter to the church of Sardis. This is found in Revelation chapter 3 verses 1 through 6. And after we read the passage here, I'm going to do a review of basically the timeline because uh, the things that we read about in the letter to the church of Sardis are sort of unintelligible unless you understand them in the context of basically uh, the whole scope of end time things, basically from the time that we're raptured until the day of God, which is the eternal day. And a lot of scripture, including the end time prophecies that are in the writings of Paul and Peter and Jude and Revelation, of course, talk about this whole grand scheme, this whole very large plan of God. And most of us are so wrapped up in this one small event called the rapture that we neglect uh, the the bigger picture, and it's really hard to even see where we fit in to the big picture unless you know what the big picture is. So what we need to do really is just back up, see the big picture, and then we can focus in and see how the details fit into this larger picture. So let's take a look at the uh, passage in Revelation. And to the angel or messenger of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And I'm just going to uh, mention here that Revelation tells the end time story symbolically. There's not seven spirits of God. Seven is the number of divinity. It's the number of fullness. And Jesus carries with him the fullness of the Holy Spirit who is God. And Jesus also has the seven stars, the seven messengers. He says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you've received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, so what I want to do now is a real brief review. 
And uh, if you're new to my channel, a lot of this is going to sound like um, heresy. It's going to sound like, what on earth is she talking about? I would uh, suggest that you take a look at my Revelation chapter by chapter series. If you want to learn how I see the 144,000 in the book of Revelation, I have videos on the 144,000. If you're interested in looking at the videos on the letters to the seven churches, you can take a look at those as well. So um, sometimes uh, I need a little getting used to. You need to listen to my videos, various ones, you know, a few times to actually get a feel for what I'm talking about. And I think once you become engaged in this process of interpretation, I think you're going to find a whole lot of freedom and uh, revelation in it. So the first thing that I want to point out is that the letters to the seven churches are not church history. Jesus says he's coming to almost every one of these churches, including the church at Sardis. And we know that in the first century, Jesus did not come for the people uh, in Sardis. So this is not an historical um, letter. We're not talking about this actually happened in history. We're talking about prophecy, about end time prophecy. This also is not a letter to uh, the, the Reformation Church or anything like that. This has nothing to do with European uh, uh, Christendom. Okay, remember, there are Christians all over the world. And when people take a sort of, you know, this is the history of the church ages, you know, through the last 2,000 years, that's a very Western way of looking at it. And God does not view Christianity through a Western lens. He views it as there are churches and believers all over the world. And in fact, there may be more believers living in Asia than ever lived in Europe. So this whole idea of taking uh, Christianity and dividing it into ages according to our understanding of uh, the this Western understanding, I think we really need to abandon it. It does not show any respect for our fellow brothers and sisters who live in other parts of the world. So the information contained in the letters to the seven churches is meant for end-time believers, specifically the 144,000 of Israel, who are the next tier, okay, the next apostolic tier. Just like the 12 apostles were that apostolic group on which the later church, you know, was built upon that group, um, there is going to be another first level tier of believers, and in this case, it's not 12 apostles, it's 12 times 12,000, and of course, this is a symbolic number. The 144,000 are going to be that group of people who carry the baton once we leave. This new group of believers must overcome during the final days of of the harlot's reign on earth. So there is the reign of Mystery Babylon during, um, and that's been going on basically since the time of Babel. And Mystery Babylon, this sort of hidden um, uh, order system, it's uh, coming into full view now where pretty much everybody can see that the people who are running the show are not the kings and presidents and governments of the world. It's these people who are behind the scenes who are calling the shots. A lot of people think that these people are part of the New World Order, which is the beast thing, but that's not correct. The harlot is her own entity that Satan has been using, and he's going to get rid of her because after all, you just use a harlot. He's going to get rid of her, and then the kingdom will be transferred. Um, and actually, it's a kingdom. It's not just a system ruling over kings. It's a kingdom with the beasts uh, at the helm. And Satan is going to give his power, throne, and authority to the beast, who will then reign for 42 months. So if we were to look at this on a timeline, uh, the child who represents you and me 
faithful believers. Hopefully that's what we're wanting to be. And there's going to be a time when that child represented as a son, okay, not as a bride, but as sons who are going to be caught up to God and to his throne and then appear in heaven as the 24 elders, right, in Revelation 4 and 5. So this is a rapture. It's the first one. And I know most people only think there's one, although there's a few people coming out now who are saying, oh no, there's three of them. There's three raptures. And the book of Revelation shows us three different groups of raptured people who appear in heaven at different times. They're wearing different clothes, doing different things, and they each sing their own song. Okay, Revelation chapter 5. The elders sing their own song. In Revelation 14, the 144,000 appear in heaven and they sing a song that nobody else can sing. It's their song. And then in Revelation 15, there is another group showing up beside the sea of glass and they sing their own song and they actually overcame the beast, the image of the beast, the number of his name and so on. So these are people who will be alive and be believers uh, after the, the beast begins to reign. So we're going to be caught up. The ministry then that we are hold right now is going to be transferred to the 144,000. And they are told that if they overcome, they will be kept from the hour of trial. I'm going to go into this in just a minute about the hour, the hour of trial. They're going to be kept from that hour of trial. They'll have their own rapture. And that's the second one right here. Okay, the hour of trial is when Mystery Babylon is destroyed. It's at the sixth trumpet, when a third of mankind is destroyed. Okay, this, the sixth trumpet is right here. It's the same day as the abomination of desolation. It's the same thing as the second woe. Right? It's when the harlot is destroyed at that hour of trial that comes on the whole earth. I have done a video called um, In a Single Hour, and this talks about how we follow the word hour through the book of Revelation. Anytime you see the word hour, and with this other exception that we're going to look at today, anytime you see the word hour, it's referring to this day right here, the hour that the harlot is destroyed. Once the harlot is destroyed, that's when the beast begins to reign. Okay, so the harlot has been ruling up till this point in time. And remember, the beast hates the harlot. He and 10 kings will be given authority for one hour to destroy the harlot with fire, smoke, and sulfur. All right, we also know that there's going to be a 200 million man army and four angels that are bound at the river Euphrates will also be released. There's going to be this huge conflagration on that day. This is the end of World War III. Okay, that's when World War III comes to an end. Okay, that's when this present system that we're all living under right now is destroyed. And then the beast will set up a kingdom for 42 months. Okay. 42 months. All right. So here we have the child caught up. They become the 24 elders. They sing their own song. The 144,000 show up in heaven before the hour of trial. That is those who are chosen, who also are faithful, who overcome. Okay. You can be called and chosen and still not be faithful. Okay. And that's what it says in the letters to the seven churches that are written specifically for these people, although there's application for us too. We'll look at that a little bit later on. They're going to be taken before the hour of trial, and um, that's three and a half days before the abomination of desolation, before the sixth trumpet. This is first fruits right here. All right. If Christ returns on the Day of Atonement, In some year, all you have to do is subtract 1,260 days and you end up um, a few days after Passover. You end up three and a half days after first fruits. 
Okay, that's how it works every year. Subtract 1,260 days from the Day of Atonement, you'll end up here. And this is when the remnant begins to flee for 1,260 days and Christ returns right here. Now, we've also been told that the tribulation of those days is going to be cut short. Okay, the tribulation is cut short. And what it means by the tribulation of those days being cut short, we're talking about the persecution that these people have to endure is going to be cut short. We don't know how short, we don't know when, but this is when that third rapture takes place. And that's the one where people are standing beside the sea of glass with harps in their hands and they're singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Okay. So that's that third raptured group. They overcame the beast. Um, these are not souls under an altar. They're not people who are martyrs. These are people who survived. Okay, and these are the people that when Jesus comes on a cloud to harvest the earth, these are the people he's harvesting. You don't harvest dead Christians because their souls are automatically in heaven. You harvest living believers. And those are the ones that show up in Revelation 15. All right, so... It's cut short. The tribulation of those days is cut short. Those who endure to the end, right here, are saved. They're going to be delivered. All right, so what happens is, is the day of the Lord, which is the millennium, okay, the millennium is the day of the Lord or the day of Christ, however you want to look at it, actually begins with the wrath of God. And we know that it's a day of darkness and not light. It's a day that the Jews said they wanted to see come. And, and the prophet said, why do you want to see it come? It's going to start out really bad. That's what Peter says, too. That's going to come like a thief in the night. And when, it, when the day of the Lord ends, it's going to end with the heavens and the earth being dissolved. Okay, It's, it's going to be dissolved by fire. And God is going to create a new heavens and a new earth. And that's when we have the day of God. That's according to 2 Peter chapter 3. So what happens here is we have an overlap of the day of the Lord, the millennium, and the bowl judgments right here. The, day, the tribulation of those days is cut short, but the beast still has 42 months to reign. And the, um, the remnant of Israel will be in the wilderness for 1,260 days. All right. When... This age ends, which is going to be right here, whatever, whenever that is, that's when the day of the Lord or the coming age that the disciples were asking Jesus about in Matthew 24. So when will be the end of the age and basically when's going to be the beginning of the time when you're going to reign. And so uh, this is the end of this age and the beginning of the day of the Lord. Okay, so three raptures, that, this is ours, kings and priests, 24 elders seated in God's uh, throne room, 144,000 who are also going to be brought into the throne room of God, um, and then this other group that's going to be taken on a day that nobody knows the day or the hour, Christ is going to come like a thief in the night, he's going to harvest living believers and bring them into heaven. Okay, so that's that's the background there. Okay, so this group of believers has to overcome the harlot. And I've done a whole bunch of studies on what that means and how to avoid and how they need to avoid harlot influence, how you can recognize harlot influence in the church. Okay, and we're so used to harlot influence in the church that as believers nowadays, we have a very difficult time even seeing it. Okay, so look at some of my videos on that. Um, I'll leave some links to that. Okay, so the hour of trial doesn't refer to the beginning of a seven-year tribulation. It refers to this day right here, the hour, day, month, and year when uh, a third of mankind is destroyed. In Revelation, all references to time need to be taken literally. If you can't take references to time literally, then none of this is going to be helpful to anybody. You have to be able to know and count the 1,260 days, the 42 months. You need to know about the five months that, that um, those beings are going to torture people who don't have the seal of God. 
we need to know how all this plays out so nobody is surprised. Okay, and a lot of this won't apply to us personally, but it will apply to family and friends people who don't know the Lord, who aren't going to be taken in this rapture, or people who aren't taking um, the Lord seriously in their life. So all of the time references are to be taken literally. I've done a video on that. There is another event that will take place over the course of a single hour, and that is the hour that Jesus comes for this third rapture right here. That's also only over an hour. It's an hour time period on a day. So let's take a look at the passage in Revelation 14, 14 through 16, where it talks about this hour. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And remember in Thessalonians, it talks about Jesus coming with the clouds. That's, that's this rapture here. It, it's not ours. Okay. And another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come. This is not a figurative hour. This is a literal hour, as we're going to see as we continue on here. For the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Okay, this refers to the third rapture when Christ will come on a cloud on an unknown day to harvest living believers from the earth. And by the way, everything is in my show notes. I'll leave a link to that in the description box. Um, this is going to coincide with the sixth seal, which is when the sun goes dark and the moon turns to blood, just prior to the day of the Lord, the time when the wrath of God is going to be poured out on the beast and, the, and his kingdom uh, at the very beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. This is the day and hour that nobody knows, Matthew 24, 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. This is the day that's going to come like a thief in the night, surprising those who are not watchful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 8. Uh, speaking of believers, but you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breast plate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation okay and we're talking about thieves here coming in um, when uh, nobody's expecting them and then uh, this passage in Matthew 24 42 through 44 therefore stay awake for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming but know this, that if the master of the house had known at what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would have not let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. It's interesting to me how that word hour is used over and over again with respect to this event right here, that uh, thief in the night, unknown day when Christ comes, which is going to be right at the beginning uh, of the day of the Lord, just prior to the bold judgments. That's when those days will be cut short and whoever endures to the end will be saved. They'll be raptured. And Paul talks about those who are alive and remain. That word remain is survive. Those who are alive and survive will be caught up. And they're going to meet the believers who've already been resurrected who come with Christ on the clouds. So if the 144,000 do not overcome the harlot, that is, they fail to heed the commands of the Lord and they allow this infiltration of the harlot into their church, they're going to be left behind at this rapture right here. They're not going to be taken. They're going to be left behind. Okay? They will need to endure the reign of the beast, okay, over here, 
and overcome him by not taking the mark or worshiping him or his image. And if they are not faithful to Christ at that time, they may be left behind with the hypocrites. And we read about that actually in Matthew 24, 48 through 51. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Right, so they will be left, they'll be left behind and have to endure the bold judgments. Okay, I know this doesn't fit in with a lot of people's theology about that we're not destined for wrath. And technically, um, there's plenty of opportunities to not have the wrath of God here. And by the way, the wrath of God at this time uh, during the bold judgments is on the beast in the beast kingdom and the people who follow the beast. And there's going to be survivors. There were eight people who survived the flood of Noah's day. When this wrath comes, there's going to be one taken and one left. It's 50%. <laughs> Half the people who are alive at that time uh, will uh, survive, and they will go on into the millennium. The true wrath of God is the lake of fire. No believer, no one who is born again, sealed in the Holy Spirit, will be going in the lake of fire. We're not destined for that wrath, right? We're not destined for that wrath. So we have some themes going here. We have the theme of watchfulness, Christ coming like a thief, the hour that Christ will come, and all of these are found in the letter to the church of Sardis, as well as several of these other places that I've already read um, in this video so far. So let's get into this message to Sardis now. What is the meaning of the name Sardis? And remember, the meaning of the city names has uh, application or it gives us hints or clues about kind of what we're talking about. So the letter to the church of Smyrna, for example, Smyrna means myrrh. Myrrh is attached to the incense that's offered on the altar. It's also connected with um, death and embalming and preparing bodies for death. It's connected with um, the souls under the altar, people who are going to die, whose lives are going to be sacrificed. It's connected with prayer. The 24 elders offer up incense on the golden altar as they're praying for the people who are on the earth, who are going to be saved. And uh, some of them, many of them are going to be martyrs. So Tied up in this name Smyrna is the all the um, symbolism that goes with myrrh. So the name Sardis means remnant or escaping. Okay, remnant or escaping. So there's going to be a couple of opportunities for the 144,000 to escape. Okay, right here. They'll be able to escape at their rapture. Uh, when we get to the letter of the Church of Philadelphia, we'll read more about that. The second chance they have to escape, this remnant of them that will be left will be right here at that third rapture event. So I want to give you a little history about Sardis. And I've taken this from uh, a website called diggingfortruth.org. And uh, the link for that is in the show notes here. I'm just going to read excerpts from that article because the history of this town is, uh, applies to, to what we see going on here. So Sardis was founded in the 12th century before Christ and was, is one of the oldest and most important cities of Asia. It was located about 35 miles southeast of Thyatira, and we've already talked about uh, the church of Thyatira. Until it was captured by Cyrus in 549 BC, Ca uh, Sardis was the capital of the kingdom of Lydia and became so again after the fall of the Roman power in Asia around uh, AD 395. So Lydia was one of the richest kingdoms of the ancient world. The Lydians are reputed to have been the inventors of coined money. 
The ancient city of Sardis was built on a plateau of crumbling rock rising 1,500 feet above a plain. So you have a plain, and then there's this plateau, and they were located on top of the plateau, all right? Now, around the plateau were these jagged mountain peaks all around the city. The plateau was a part of Mount Tomolus, whose height was 6,700 feet. The walls of the elevation on which the city was built were almost perpendicular, and the city was inaccessible except for one narrow passage, which was steep and easily fortified and guarded. So you've got this plain, uh, a plateau that's up, and then uh, these jagged peaks all around the plateau in which the city was built on the inside, and one little narrow path that goes up to that city, and they could just guard that really easily. The uh, road was very steep, and um, it was easy for them to guard their city. Sardis was considered an impregnable fortress. The natural defenses of Sardis made the guards and citizens proud and overconfident. The walls were carelessly guarded with sometimes fatal results. Because of the failure of the guards to watch, Cyrus captured the city in 549 BC. And here's the story. One dark night, a Persian soldier resolved to approach the citadel and attempt to climb the precipice at a place where no guards were ever set. There the rock was so precipitous and impracticable that it would seem impossible to scale. Herodotus says that the soldier climbed the rock himself and other Persians followed in his track until a large number had mounted to the top. Thus Sardis was taken and given up entirely to pillage. But the lesson was soon forgotten. For 330 years later, the city was again captured through stratagem by Antiochus the Great. Solon had warned the overconfident Croesus that no human being is self-sufficient in every respect. Something is always lacking. In every matter, it becomes us to, to mark well the end, for oftentimes the divinity gives men a gleam of happiness and then submerges them in ruin. And that's uh, a guy named Solon was making this statement to Croesus, who was the king uh, of Sardis um, earlier on. So in light of the historic background of the city of Sardis, the epistle of Christ to the Sard Sardian church was very appropriate and its language very impressive. He told them to be watchful, and if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. The city had fallen and was finally destroyed because the ruler and citizens had been overconfident. Its sentinels had failed to maintain a diligent watch. The enemy took them off guard. Jesus warned the church that if they too failed to watch because of overconfidence, he would overtake them as a thief in the most unexpected moment. Okay, so that's the end of that quote. So believers of the Church of Sardis are warned of the various serious implications that may arise because they're not watchful or awake. The name Sardis means remnant or escaping. Because of its virtually impregnable position on top of a craggy cliff, the people living in the historical city of Sardis became lax with regard to watching. As a result, they were captured by enemy invaders, not once, but twice. And this is where the scary part of the letter of the church to Sardis sort of interjects itself. This speaks to the idea that there are some among this potential group of 144,000 people who may be left behind not once but twice because they are not watchful. The letter to the Church of Sardis serves as a letter of warning to these believers not to live carelessly. As the meaning of the name Sardis suggests, these believers have the promise of escaping the judgment of the harlot, that is the 
uh, six trumpet uh, judgment right here. Or if they fail to overcome and thus disqualify themselves from being taken in that rapture, then they need to remain watchful and awake so as to not miss that final rapture before judgment falls on the beast and his kingdom right here. In order for this group to walk in white, they need to keep their garments unstained and undefiled. Uh, yet you have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. In this case, one's garment refers to their body and how one lives in the body in this life. Now let's take a look at that word soiled or stained. This comes from the Greek word moluno. It's in Strong's number 3435. And this means to stain or to defile. Uh, the Greek word moluno is translated here as stained or soil. And this word is only used three times in the New Testament. And two of these times it's in the book of Revelation. So this passage here is talking about uh, people uh, who have not soiled their garments. That is, they haven't uh, done things. They don't have beliefs. They haven't done actions that lead to spiritual defilement. Okay, that's what it means to be, to be stained. It means to be defiled. And the implication is that some believers may become spiritually defiled. In Revelation, this word is used symbolically in connection with the 144,000 of Israel. The 144,000 who overcome the harlot are said to be moluno, undefiled, unstained, and pure. Revelation 14, 4. These are the ones who have not been defiled, moluno. For they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. In the letter to the church of Sardis, there is also a reference to walking with the Lord. They will walk with me in white. And again in chapter 14, about the 144,000, there is an inferred reference to walking. They're the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. The church of Sardis is reminded to stay awake and dressed ready to leave at a moment's notice. Remember during the time of the Passover, uh, the people were to stay up all night, eat the Passover lamb, and keep their clothes on and be ready to leave at a moment's notice. Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who remains awake and clothed so that he will not go naked and let his shame be exposed. All right. The Bible tells us that just prior to the time when God's wrath will be poured out in the seven bold judgments, Jesus will come like a thief to rapture those who are awake and watching for him. Those who are not watching will be caught off guard and may find themselves in opposition to Christ. Christ may come for others, but against them. Revelation 3.3, 3, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Okay, this can also be translated, you will not know the hour I will come upon you. The letter to the church of Sardis is a warning that's intended for all the churches, all seven of the churches. Every one of the seven letters has application to all of those end time believers because all seven churches form one single unified cohort of new Israelite believers. The warnings given in this letter inform us that it's possible. Okay, and this is the crazy thing. It's possible that they may end up missing both raptures. Yet this seems to be the very real possibility that's being addressed in the letter to the church of Sardis. And they'll have no excuse because they will have already been warned. In the letter to Sardis, Christ appeals to the fact that he's given them the Holy Spirit. And he even sent special messengers to warn them. The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Revelation 3.1 Further, Christ exhorts them to remember what they were given. What were they given? They were given the Holy Spirit. 
they were sealed in the Holy Spirit. And he exhorts them to remember what they heard. What did they hear? They heard the message of the letter from the angels that were sent to them. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. This church is going to be warned ahead of time about the dangers facing them. And they will have already been sealed and baptized in the Holy Spirit to help them overcome. All they need to do is remember the warnings and to keep or guard the message that they were given. The word keep um, is Strong's number 5083, Tereo to guard or keep. It's used 11 times in the book of Revelation. It first appears in Revelation chapter 1 as an exhortation to those to whom the testimony or the message of Revelation was committed. They were instructed to keep or to guard the message and keep it from being tampered with. Revelation 1, 1 through 3, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. And he made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness, that is, he testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep or guard what is written in it, for the time is near. At the close of Revelation, the angel gave John the same warning about keeping or guarding the message. Revelation 22, 9b. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep or guard the words of this book. Worship God. And then Jesus repeats basically the same warning that people need to safeguard this message uh, and its integrity. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. Okay, that's some serious stuff. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. Very serious uh, ramifications for people who tamper with the actual message. Okay, it, we're not talking about, you know, interpretations or people trying to study the book or having an interpretation. We're talking about people who actually go into the Greek text and fiddle with it so that it's not correct anymore. Okay, because in order for our understanding of the end time events to be complete or to be accurate, everything has to be in place. And from what I can see, I think it is. I don't think the message was tampered with. Uh, the only exception would be um, the addition of chapters and verses, which are placed in some very unfortunate locations, which have led people to interpret the book wrongly. Okay, I've talked about that in other videos. The, the real biggie one that comes to mind is uh, Revelation 8, chap, um, chapter 8, verse 1, with the silence in heaven for half an hour. That seventh seal event should actually be connected with all the rest of the seals, and that chapter should end there, and then the whole trumpet um, sequence is a whole another thing that has nothing to do with any of the seals. The trumpets do not come out of the seventh seal. Okay, the seal is its own shopping list, and the trumpets are its own series of events, and the seals and trumpets overlay one another in time. So if the believers of Sardis will keep or guard the message of revelation that's given to them by the messengers, and if they will listen to the voice of the sevenfold spirit and overcome, they will not be left behind when Christ comes for them. If they ignore the spirit and they ignore the warning delivered by the messengers uh, of the angel that comes to their church, they will have no one to blame except for themselves if they find themselves left behind. Now, these believers have another problem, too. Their actions and their works fail to match up with their reputation. Christ knows their works and knows that they don't meet God's expectations. 
These people started well, but as they approach the finish line, they are lacking. They trusted that the glory of their early days as believers in Christ are going to last forever without any effort, without any watchfulness, that whatever they were doing in the beginning is just going to, you know, keep going until the end when they are hopefully raptured. But what Christ is saying here is that the works that they did in the beginning, which led to them having this reputation of being spiritually alive, these works have to continue to the very end, or else God will see their efforts as being incomplete and their race unfinished. Revelation 3, the second half of verse 1 and 2. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. These believers are seen resting on their laurels. Whatever spiritual works they did in the beginning that allowed them to have this reputation of possessing spiritual vitality had long since died away without them even noticing. Only vestiges of their former spiritual strength and glory remained, and what little was left was about to disappear as well. And their works were incomplete in God's sight. Through lack of watchful perseverance, these people may miss out on the deliverance God desires for them. And if they persist in unrepentant unbelief, they stand to lose more than just not being taken in the rapture. They may lose their inheritance during the millennium. They could even lose their right to enter the holy city in God's eternal kingdom as indicated by the following Verse, Revelation 3, 5, and 6. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. As we've discovered in earlier studies on outer darkness or blackest darkness, it's possible for someone to be saved from eternal wrath in the lake of fire, but still suffer a miserable eternity outside the holy city, away from the presence of God and the Lamb, living in blackest darkness, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's possible for wicked servants to not only be left behind at the rapture, before the hour of trial, and the secret third rapture, but to actually be, de be denied a place in the holy city. This is what it means to have one's name blotted out of the book of life. Okay, hang in there with me. Having your name in the book of life is not the same thing as being saved. Okay. I used to think, as many still think, and, and this is the common teaching, that this reference to not having one's name uh, blotted out of the book of life actually means that it's an impossibility for someone to have their name blotted out of the book of life. But there's a passage in Revelation 22 that tells us that it is possible to lose one's share in the tree of life in the holy city and only believers are promised a share in the tree of life. That's a promise made to believers that we will have a share in the tree of life. Revelation twenty two nineteen. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book, and also in the letter to the church at Ephesus. Revelation 2, 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. It's a right that God gives his people, a right that can be taken away or blotted out. We know that the holy city is going to be a city of light, 
a glorious kind of light which will emanate from God and from the Lamb. And it's going to be have a kind of light that you don't need sun or moon or anything. Now, the new earth is going to have a sun and a moon, but the holy city does not need that. In fact, the, the light of the sun and the moon is going to pale in comparison to the light of the glory of God. Revelation 21, 23, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it because the glory of God illuminates the city and the lamb is its lamp. So to be outside the holy city, it's a city of light. Remember, to be outside the holy city is to be outside in a kind of an equal sort of, but opposite kind of darkness. Um, it's the blackest darkness. It's not just dark darkness. It's blackest darkness, just like the light of the city is the brightest light. Jude verses 11 and 13, talking about believers who are teachers. These men are hidden reefs in your love feasts, shamelessly feasting with you, but shepherding only themselves. They are wild waves on the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. These are Christians, they're believers who were given the Holy Spirit, who became teachers, who apostatized, who because they're saved, they're not going to go into the lake of fire, but they will go into blackest darkness outside the city. The only people who will be allowed entrance into the holy city will be those who have their names written in the book of life. Revelation 21 verses 26 and 27. And into the city will be brought the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who practices an abomination or a lie, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You can be a Christian, have your name blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life, and never be able to enter the Holy City. Have your right to the Tree of Life, your portion, taken away. And there will be people who will be resurrected at the time of the Great White Throne Judgment. I'm going to look at that this in a minute. Who will have their names in the Book of Life and live on the new earth and be granted access to to the holy city to eat from the tree of life and to drink from the water of life. They're going to be invited. The spirit and the bride say, come. They're going to be invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. That's when the marriage supper is right over here during the day of God. We're not going to be going to a seven-year marriage supper starting when we're raptured. Okay. It would seem that all believers have their names written automatically in the book of life. However, we have to understand this. We're not saved because our name is in the book of life, because our name is, has been written there. We're saved through faith in Christ. As believers, we are not going to be judged at the great white throne judgment. We've already passed from death to life. There is no judgment for our works or whether or not our name is in the book of life over here. We've already passed over from death to life. So there's going to be people living during the day of the Lord, during the time of the millennium, as well as other people as well, who when they come to the uh, time of the great white throne judgment, the books will be opened, they'll be judged by their works, and they'll be judged by whether or not their name is written in the Lamb's book of life. We have to have people populating the new earth. Who are those people going to be? They're going to be all the people whose names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundation of the world. And they're saved by the blood of the Lamb, but they're not saved through faith. Okay, That's the difference between people who live in the holy city and people who are living on the new earth. We're saved by faith. Faith pleases God. All right? And there is a city prepared for people of faith. Uh, take a look at, uh, I think it's uh, Hebrews chapters 11 and 12. So this is the great white throne judgment 
we're going to take a look at that real quickly here so you can see that people who are resurrected at that time are judged by their works and whether or not their name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. Revelation 20 verses 12 through 15. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and there were open books, and one of them was the Book of Life. And the dead were judged according to their deeds as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up its dead, and death and Hades gave up their dead, and each one was judged according to his deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone was found whose name was not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. As believers, we will never enter into judgment because we have already passed from death to life through faith in Christ. John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Believers will be delivered from the lake of fire because they belong to God right? Having been given the seal of the Spirit, which is God's mark of ownership. However, once saved, believers need to follow the leading of the Spirit, even more so during the last days, so as to not have their names blotted out of the book of life and thereby being denied access to the holy city. Believers who are unclean, that is spiritually soiled and defiled, who practice abominations and who lie, will be among those whose names will be blotted out of the book of life. The reference to a lie brings us back to the true undefiled 144,000 of Israel in whose mouths no lie is found. Revelation 14.5, and no lie was found in their mouths, for they are blameless. Now, if those who have soiled garments cleanse themselves, if they repent, if they cleanse from spiritual defilement, which is what it means to have uh, soiled or stained garments, um, they uh, will regain their right to access the holy city, okay, if they repent. So it's very important that people who still have time to repent do repent. Revelation 22, 14 and 15. Blessed are those who wash their robes. In other words, if their robes were stained, they saw that they were stained, they were spiritually defiled, and they said, I am repenting. I am, I'm going to turn the other way. I'm going to change directions, which is what repentance means. It means to have a change of mind and change your direction. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Washing one's robe carries with it the idea of repentance. This passage is not telling us that somehow we need to save ourselves from God's wrath by being good enough or trying to clean up our lives. This passage is addressing the issue of an already saved person repenting of evil or unbelief so that they can be sanctified and holy when Christ comes for them, thus obtaining access to the holy city and everything that goes with it, including the tree of life and the presence of God. Okay, I hope you can see here that the most serious warning given to any of the seven churches is the one given right here in the letter to the church of Sardis. But it applies to all seven of the churches that we read about in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And this letter brings up so many disturbing details regarding the eternal destiny and what happens to faithless or maybe even apostate firstborn believers among that called in 144,000 of Israel, that there's the potential to miss out on not just one, but two raptures and the possibility of even having their names blotted out of the book of life and being banished to outer darkness outside the holy city. And all this may come upon them because they didn't take these warnings seriously. They didn't remember what they had received and what they had heard. Okay, remember Sardis, 
They thought they were unconquerable. They thought they had it made. They thought that it was all in the bag, that they could never be conquered or overcome. And they were conquered not just once, but twice. And the name Sardis means remnant or escaping. They should be escaping. They should have this way of escape. It's very important for them. But without watchfulness, without being awake, without keeping oneself unstained, or if one does have a stained or defiled a spiritual life, that they repent from that. And though I believe that the promises and the warnings contained in the letters to the seven churches have specific application to this group right here, the 144,000 of Israel who are called and chosen and hopefully faithful and overcoming, um, these warnings are also written to you and me, present day believers, and that we need to heed these warnings as well. Being called and chosen is not enough to inherit everything that God has in store for us. We must also be faithful. It's called, chosen, and faithful, and persevere until the very end. And I just want to make a comment here that a lot of us feel like we're, you know, we're failing or we're failures or we're not good enough or we're, um, we're doing everything wrong, that our sins or whatever are going to keep us from an inheritance and so on. I'm just going to tell you this. There is no being perfect or doing everything right in this life. What we are called to, though, is to be faithful and to be faithful until the very end of our race. That no matter how we stumble forward, we keep getting up. That we keep, you know, one hand um, hanging on to the Holy Spirit and letting his hand hang on to us. And that when we fall, we get up again. That we strengthen our weak knees. That we keep moving forward. Never, ever give up. Okay? Never, ever give up. Keep moving forward no matter how you stumble forward. Okay, so God has equipped us with everything that we need. He is not after our perfection in this life. He knows that uh, we have a body of death. He knows that there is sin dwelling in our bodies that makes it um, almost impossible for us to be perfect in this life. Well, it is impossible because this body of death is dragging us down. And once we no longer have this body of death and we receive our immortal and then glorified bodies, that sin is not going to be the problem that it is now. But right now, God is using all of these things in our life to make us more and more conform to the image of Christ. There's this wonderful passage in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 3 through 11. God's divine power or his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Everything. Through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. Through these he has given us his precious and magnificent promises that through them we may become partakers of the divine nature. Now that you have escaped from the corruption that is in the world caused by evil desires. God's plan is that we actually become um, participants in the divine community. That we are, we've been invited into that fellowship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that there was plenty of room for more, and he's included us. Um, in John 17, I in them, thou in me, and all of us all together, all perfectly one. Verse 5, for this very reason, because of these promises, make every effort to add to your faith. We're going to add to our faith now. We're going to add virtue. And to virtue, we're going to add knowledge. And to knowledge, we're going to add self-control. And to self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities and continue to grow in them, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge that is your experiential knowledge 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever lacks these things, whoever lacks these traits, is nearsighted to the point of blindness, having forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, brothers, strive, strive to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a lavish reception into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, I'd like to close with the good news. There is so much hope. I'm just going to tell you this. Hang in there with Jesus and don't quit. Okay, that's the bottom line. Don't quit. Keep going. And there is going to be some very difficult days ahead. I am uh, anticipating extremely difficult days ahead in the next few months. Very difficult. And many people are going to start to wonder if Jesus is coming. He is coming. And he wants you to persevere. You need to persevere to the very end. Okay, keep trusting in, in the word of God. Believe what he has said. Um, uh, receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Walk in the, the fruit of the Spirit. Walk in love. Walk in um, faithful perseverance. And you're going to receive everything that God has promised to you. And, and more than you can possibly imagine. So let me know what you think. Leave a um, comment in the comment section. We'll see you on another video. Till then, have a blessed day.